Imagine you see someone gasping for air and unable to breathe. You know you can put a pill or a drop of liquid under their tongue, and they will instantly be able to utilize 50% more oxygen, and it will save them. But for some reason, you don't. Now imagine it's millions of people suffering like this, and nobody is lifting a finger or saying a word. The tortoise lays on its back, its belly baking in the hot sun, beating its legs, trying to turn itself over, but it can't. Not without your help. But you're not helping. What do you mean I'm not helping? This question's Leon. While this may seem crazy, that is exactly what's been going on since 2020. Methylene blue provides instantaneous relief to breathing problems and is shown experimentally in animals to even help with extreme lung trauma and wound healing. Instead, we get a safe and defective experimental quack treatment. Our one chance is transdental electromicide. I'll need a golf cart motor with a thousand volt capacitor. Stand! With methylene blue, inflammation goes down dramatically, and this is ultimately what kills people in respiratory infections. It also inhibits cytokine storm by upregulating T reg cells, which dampens the autoimmune reactions that cause it without interfering with normal positive immune reactions. It's also a strong, generalized antiviral that will help in essentially all viral infections. It amazes me not only that the medical system has not made use of it as a frontline treatment, but even the so-called fringe people who cause so much controversy by promoting a deworming agent for this cause never picked up the idea of using methylene blue. Methylene blue is more effective than this stuff in every way including in fighting malaria, and has absolutely no side effects at the doses you would take it for use as a supplement or an immune booster or as an antiviral. Well, it does have one side effect, which is turning skin blue when it comes directly into contact, but this is temporary and harmless. Just be careful when you apply it, or if you stick around, I'll give you a little tip later that will show you how to completely avoid this side effect. Methylene blue is also easily available, and you can be sure it always will be because it is a ubiquitous chemical that has many uses outside of the body that are absolutely vital for industry and lab work. I also wanted to say a few more things about vitamin D before I get too caught up in talking about methylene blue. I've not taken it in a long time because I've been getting it through sunlight and from food, so I can't really help with brands. Just keep in mind that brands become better or worse all the time, and usually it's for the worse. So you have to be careful in that regard and always keep on top of things, unfortunately. Vitamin D is usually in a capsule with oil, and most of the time it's a seed oil, which is terrible for your health. So it's probably better to just get it from the sun and diet, and possibly a UV bulb if possible. And when I don't get enough sun or get enough in the diet, that's what I use. I have a UVB bulb. The dosing is not easy for vitamin D because people respond much differently, and they get varying amounts of sunlight and dietary vitamin D. I used to take a brand with a name I don't remember, but it had 50,000 international units per capsule, and I'd take two of those per week at the same time, once a week. That may be overkill for some people, but it should not cause toxicity so long as it's D3 and not D2. It can also be important to have enough vitamin K2, but again, it's better when this comes from the diet. This comes mainly from grass-fed dairy, which I know is a bit expensive, but it's probably a good investment. Thankfully, K1 is easier to get and will be found in many sources and the body can convert it to K2 and vice versa. The K2 found in animal products is K2 Mark 4 and the kind that usually comes in supplements is K2 Mark 7. This comes from plants 
and the body can't really use this unless it converts it to K4 and not everyone is able to properly do that. K2 is sort of a fad supplement today and I would not go too overboard thinking it's going to have astonishing benefits. I don't take it in supplement form, but I do put K2 powder into my homemade oil of oregano toothpaste, and that seems to be working out so far. Commercial toothpaste today seems to have more and more questionable chemicals in it by the minute. And now that I have left it behind, my mouth no longer feels like a chemical toilet after I brush my teeth. I'm still refining the formula, if you could even call it a formula, but I'll probably make a video about this soon and provide more details. Nowadays, I care more about supplements that help your health than trying to improve myself. But back in the day, I took things like Huperzine, Venpositine, Ginkgo Biloba, Pyracetam, and a lot of stuff most people have never heard of and you probably won't see videos on on YouTube. This was back in the 90s when there was not as much to worry about as far as contamination goes. And a lot of these things you would get from basically some guy on a forum. Most of this stuff didn't do much for me, and I don't really think most so-called nootropics are worth much. They might be useful for certain people in certain circumstances, but I think for most people, it's just a waste of time and money. And these days, a lot of herbal supplements are also fake or massively underdosed. And when they're not, they're just too expensive to justify what they do. But there was one thing that actually did something it didn't have crazy side effects and it was very cheap at the time and that was methylene blue i sent some guy 75 to 100 bucks and he sent me about a kilo of methylene blue powder and that's probably enough for a lifetime and i wish i could find that bag now these days i see a little bottle of methylene blue for 60 dollars when the ingredients probably cost 10 cents to make they will justify this by saying the reagent stuff is full of heavy metals, but that doesn't make much sense considering it is a wholly synthetic chemical and a very basic one at that. I would also point out that if you're worried about contamination like that, you don't have to actually ingest it. One of the best things about methylene blue is that it's extremely absorbable both in water and in fat. You could just dilute it and apply a bit to your scalp or your belly button or some other area of your body and it will get into your whole body including your brain while the contaminants probably won't. Usually though it comes in a liquid and you put drops under the tongue where it absorbs quickly and goes all through the body including the brain. It is usually hard to get supplements into the brain but methylene blue accumulates in the mitochondria and nowhere in the body has more mitochondria than the brain. Methylene blue is used medically, but at much higher doses than you would take as a supplement. I went to as high as 60 milligrams a day, but in surgeries, they can easily use 10 times that amount. However, when you're looking for mitochondrial benefits, which is the main way that methylene blue helps in the body, less is more and even 60 milligrams is quite a lot. 5 to 20 milligrams is much more reasonable, and that probably gives you the most bang for the buck. Considering it's much more expensive these days, that's probably a good idea. 30 milligrams is probably the upper maximum amount for non-medical purposes. And when I was up to 60 milligrams, I was probably undoing most of the benefits. When you go higher on methylene blue, the effects can actually reverse, especially when it comes to killing off beneficial gut bacteria. So don't think that more is better, which is often the case for aminos like glycine and taurine. You'll actually lose all benefit once you get to a certain dose. And long before that, it stops improving things and you're just wasting your money. This is also a good reason to consider small doses as they give the most bang for the buck. And it is pretty expensive and one ounce of a 1% solution only seems to have about 300 milligrams of actual methylene blue and it can cost as much as seventy dollars though there are some that are a little cheaper so if you want a decent dose it will be somewhat expensive though still much less expensive than anything your doctor is going to prescribe you for dementia studies they tend to use around 15 to 20 milligrams 
For infections, they tend to use about 30 milligrams. For mild depression and anxiety, 5 to 10 milligrams seems to be what many people prefer. But sometimes for bipolar disorder, some of the studies go up to around 200 milligrams. I don't see any drawbacks in going up to 20 milligrams, aside from the price anyway. Beyond that though, diminishing returns set in quickly and you can even cause yourself harm. While many people dislike the staining effect, this can be overcome by mixing the methylene blue in water alongside with 500 milligrams of ascorbic acid, which won't affect its effectiveness or its absorption. Methylene blue has a lot of benefits for the skin, so this is probably not a bad idea if you want to maximize these benefits by applying it directly to the skin. Otherwise, you may not like the result. People are rather reluctant to hire blue people. Just make sure to test it out somewhere unobtrusive before trying it out on your face, just in case you don't have it mixed just right. And also, it's good to understand that methylene blue has a half-life of about 5 hours, so you may want to split your dose up through the day. And you also probably don't want to take it right before going to bed or right before working out because at higher doses it can slightly increase your blood pressure for a short period of time. Methylene blue is an interesting chemical that is not entirely well understood, but in essence it goes into mitochondria and directly turns oxygen into ATP, skipping the mitochondrial transport chain elements that produce the reactive oxygen species. But when it creates this ATP, it also stimulates the final cleanup process. It seems that ATP is generated directly by the methylene blue itself inside the mitochondria, but it then completes oxidative phosphorylation. And this part is what usually fails to trigger when you're having troubles inside the cell, which lead to the cell death, especially when the cell is burning carbohydrates or linoleic acid. But regardless of how it works exactly, the end result is to increase the body's ability to burn oxygen and to create ATP by as much as 50%, and it happens almost instantly. Along with vinegar, this is one of the very few things I've taken that not only seems to work, but instantly lifts your mood and makes you feel much better. Antioxidants are all well and good, but it's amazing to think you can skip the whole oxidation process, at least to some extent, by taking methylene blue and just make the ATP directly. That way you don't do any damage in the first place. And that is important because oxidation is not only a large driver of aging, but it's also theorized by Professor Lustig and his colleagues to be the main driver of obesity over time. Lustig is one of the very few truly independent researchers out there who is not beholden to industry money. So I pay very close attention to his work. Though these experiments have yet to be conducted, I'd speculate that if lifespan and long-term obesity studies were done on methylene blue, we would find enormous benefits in both of these areas of research. After all, taurine has a similar antioxidant effect and is also an antifibrotic, that is, anti-scar tissue, and it has a surprisingly strong effect on lifespan in rodent studies. At the cellular level, methylene blue is shown to make skin fibroblasts live longer and to prevent damage to stem cell pools. It also upregulates the production of both collagen and elastin, the two most important elements of the skin when it comes to the visible effects of aging. Collagen makes your skin stronger and thicker, and elastin keeps your skin tight and wrinkle-free. This is why methylene blue is now available in many skin treatments, but I would prefer to take it systemically if possible. So whether or not methylene blue can increase lifespan, it can certainly make you look younger by preventing wrinkles and by preventing thinning of the skin, which has a striking detrimental quality to your looks. Amazingly, I recently learned that methylene blue also has a stronger effect in preventing sunburn 
than the chemical most commonly used in sunscreen. It does so by preventing destruction from reactive oxygen species produced by UVB radiation exposure and by triggering sirtuins to repair the genetic damage in the skin. This is amazing because instead of trying to block skin cancer with another carcinogenic substance, now you get a sunblock that actually blocks the development of cancer by supporting the mitochondria. I'd also like to point out that many people who took seed oils out of their diet stopped burning in the sun for similar reasons. Linoleic acid causes a huge disaster inside the mitochondria and it greatly increases reactive oxygen species and inflammation. So it makes sense that it would cause more skin damage once we know that methylene blue can stop this from happening because of its dramatic effects on cleaning up reactive oxygen species. And unlike when you use sunscreen, methylene blue will not stop the production of vitamin D. So you still get protected from sunburn and from potential skin cancer if you get these severe burns, but you're still getting the vitamin D because it's just going to block those burns. I went to a tennis tournament in Palm Springs a while back and I got absolutely hammered by the sun. I turned beet red, but surprisingly I didn't peel at all. So there seems to be some truth in these claims that linoleic acid is one of the big culprits when it comes to sun damage. Because even with no sunscreen, I didn't get any peeling at all after hours and hours and hours in the hot sun. Methylene blue also kills off many pathogenic bacteria in the gut and in the urinary tract when you take it at low doses and preserves the beneficial ones. Staph and E. coli biofilms are killed off quickly when methylene blue is administered and this mechanism will be enhanced with phototherapy. As with your own cells, lower doses will support the cell by creating new energy within aerobic bacteria, but beware because very large amounts will overwhelm these aerobic bacteria and kill them off. So you want to keep the doses moderate to low. Methylene blue is also shown to have great effect in permanently getting rid of otherwise intractable cases of Lyme disease, a chronic condition that often afflicts people for the rest of their life once they're exposed. It's also effective for malaria and other parasites, but for this use, you should be in contact with the doctor because you're probably going to need a higher dose. Enhancing oxygen use is often lethal to parasites and to harmful bacteria, but at low doses, this is very helpful for most beneficial aerobic bacteria. This same mechanism is also lethal to cancer, which can melt from the inside when oxygen use is high. Even if that does not happen, methylene blue can force mitochondria into a proper oxidative phosphorylation state, which allows even the malfunctioning mitochondria that are generally present in cancer cells to trigger apoptosis which requires the stimulation of this fourth mitochondrial complex that's there to clean up all of the reactive oxygen species and also it's involved in apoptosis. While some studies have said that methylene blue does not use oxidative phosphorylation, this isn't really true. As with burning fat, AKA beta oxidation and red light therapy, Methylene blue does not trigger the first stage. It only triggers the final stage of oxidative phosphorylation, the cleanup phase. This is the part that is often lethal to cancer cells and pathogens. And it's also the part that can rescue healthy cells from senescence or from apoptosis and allow them to repair themselves and become functional again. Methylene blue also increases total energy production, even including with glucose. So the cell will take up more glucose and use it, but the methylene blue itself is not hitting those harmful parts of the mitochondrial respiration process. Methylene blue is also used as an antidote for many poisons. This includes cyanide and carbon monoxide. 
because these interfere with ATP production in the body. Hopefully I don't have to mention this is not something you want to try at home. But if you ever wind up in a hospital for these issues, this is what the doctors will prescribe. Because of this, methylene blue saves people's lives when they're in septic shock. This is caused by lipopolysaccharides from gram-negative gut bacteria entering the bloodstream. The cell membrane of these bacteria is made of these lethal poisons that are a combination of lipid and carbohydrate that causes serious damage in the body and very low doses are enough to kill you. Methylene blue not only neutralizes these poisons, but kills the bacteria that produced them. This is extremely important as these bacteria are the root cause of NAD plus depletion in macrophages over time, and also known to cause issues with both digestion and cognition. So this leads us to a, a, an interim model which is that senescence and the SASP uh, not only induces macrophage proliferations, macrophage senescence, we've shown uh, 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 that it also induces CD38 expression. Uh, both the induction of CD38 expression in uh, macrophages and in non-macrophages cells, as, as we have recently published, uh, we believe contribute to uh, the uh, a tissue associated decrease in, in NAD and, and the uh, accompanying uh, metabolic dysfunction and sirtuin dysfunction. So the next question that I will uh, spend a few minutes on, uh, which is really key here, is to our effort to try to understand what activates CD38 expression in aging macrophages. The PAMs are pathogen-associated uh, molecular pattern. Uh, so these are molecules that are typically uh, released by pathogens. Whereas the dams are, um, are damage-associated molecular pattern uh, signatures. These are molecules that are typically released by cells that are stressed or, or injured. And macrophages are able to recognize those, to activate a specific uh, signaling pathways, and to leading to the release of cytokines, uh, chemokines, immune cell recruitments, inflammation, and tissue repair eventually. So our first question was, what uh, are any of these PAMs and DAMs able to activate um, CD38 expression in macrophages? And so the ex experiment was done by uh, isolating uh, primary macrophages from mice, uh, growing them in culture, and subjecting them to treatment with a variety of these PAMs and DAMs. And what emerged is actually a pretty striking picture. We were expecting the DAMs uh, to do it, but we were surprised to find that these macrophages actually responded primarily to pathogen-associated molecular signatures. In particular, uh, one of them uh, drew our attention. This is LPS. This is lipopolysaccharide. Um, this uh, particular uh, uh, molecule, which is released by, uh, by gram-negative gram bacteria, is actually um, uh, one of the, the main triggers for the differentiation of macrophages into a unique form in the so-called M1 macrophages. That means methylene blue should also help with anti-aging. And indeed, methylene blue, just like NMN, has been shown to increase NAD plus in cells. It also triggers the DNA repairing sirtuins that require NAD plus to function, which is the main thing that people worry about when it comes to NAD plus in the first place. And this will lead to less damage from aging over time. Methylene blue is also important when it comes to protein formation and it keeps proteins from being misfolded when they're created. This is crucial in many diseases like Lou Gehrig's disease, where methylene blue is shown to slow down the progression in animal studies. It's also very important for healthy people as a large part of the body's protein synthesis ability is wasted on cleaning up misfolding proteins in the body instead of on making new ones, as much as 30% are misfolded the first time they're created. And that means that around 30% of your collagen and elastin production goes into fixing these failures instead of producing new proteins that you can actually use. That's part of why methylene blue is shown to thicken and smooth the skin and to make it more youthful in appearance. 
Methylene blue is also very helpful for preventing the formation of scars and for quickly repairing scar tissue. This includes all fibrosis in the body, that is blood clots, spike proteins, whether natural or unnatural in origin, cirrhosis of the liver, and lung fibrosis. Methylene blue also destroys spike proteins, which other antivirals, including the controversial one, do not, making it even more criminal that it has not seen widespread use in the current situation or in cleaning up the results of other treatments. Methylene blue also enhances the activity and effectiveness of both T cells and T reg cells, and these help a great deal not only in fighting pathogens, but also cancer and autoimmune issues. In rodent studies, methylene blue has been shown to be very helpful in genetically altered mice which have symptoms similar to MS, not only because it's neuroprotective, but also because it has these important effects on the immune system, which are going to help with all autoimmune issues. Methylene blue also increases autophagy in the body, which is one of the most important mechanisms for the body to repair itself, especially in neurons. This is part of the reason that it helps to stave off dementia and can even help restore function to damaged photoreceptors in the eye, one of the most delicate parts in the entire body. Methylene blue also is shown to protect cells during hypoxic conditions, which helps a great deal in surviving injury and stroke. It's also shown to dramatically and quickly reduce inflammation. It increases the fat burning ability of cells and it switches them into a state where they prefer to burn more fat and fewer carbs, which improves their insulin resistance issues. Methylene blue is shown to heal diabetic wounds, and that's not surprising since it has a mechanism similar to phototherapy using red light and near-infrared. It also has a strong effect when it comes to diabetic neuropathy, which essentially occurs due to mitochondrial death in nerve cells, and methylene blue helps this to a great degree. Most exciting of all is that it simultaneously protects stem cell pools while promoting stem cell activation to replenish the body. It also helps prevent senescence in both the stem cell pools and the immune system. That could have a significant effect on lifespan, and even if that doesn't pan out, it will certainly have a dramatic effect on quality of life, freedom from frailty, and your apparent age. In ovarian cancer, it is shown to selectively cause apoptosis in cancer cells, while simultaneously promoting the survival and the health of healthy cells. It is mitochondria that control apoptosis, and when the mitochondria are given ATP in cancerous cells, this can allow them to cause apoptosis in those cells and finally get rid of them. Since methylene blue greatly promotes mitochondrial health, it should also do a great deal to prevent cancer, which is shown more and more over time to be a metabolic disease related to mitochondrial damage. If the mitochondria are defective, they can't use ketone bodies for energy. Only normal cells with normal mitochondria can use the ketone bodies for energy. So when people say cancer cells can burn ketone bodies, no, they can't. Then they would have to argue against all of the structural defects that I just showed you on the structure function in the mitochondria. Mitochondria of cancer cells cannot burn ketones. As a matter of fact, ketones are absolutely toxic to many cancer cells. While well, the mechanism of action for methylene blue is very similar to phototherapy, they enhance and complement each other. When cells are full of methylene blue, it sensitizes them to red light wa wavelengths. When something's red, that means it reflects the red light, and when it's pure blue, it absorbs everything except for the blue light. If your house were painted blue and it were hit by a giant laser beam that was blue, your house would be perfectly fine, so we can surmise that Oprah's house in Maui will be just fine if it gets hit by a giant blue laser somehow, though thankfully that's unlikely to ever happen. Since methylene blue turns your mitochondria very blue, it makes them very sensitive to red and infrared light, 
and those are the frequencies that are best for penetrating into the human body, while your cells actually signal each other using light and will pass light the absorbed directly to their neighbors, and the mitochondria are also recently found to move around in the body to where they're needed, it's better to directly stimulate the cells you want to heal if possible. This is especially helpful for dementia as it's very hard to penetrate the skull with light and only a small percentage of the light is going to make it through. This is used in cancer therapies too. The cancer takes in methylene blue much more greedily than the surrounding tissue and then when the laser is activated it gets burned away more quickly than the healthy tissue so you can selectively destroy only the bad cells while you keep the good cells intact. Both of these therapies will cause cells to skip glycolysis or carb burning, which is where most ROS is produced. They also enhance the final stage of oxidative phosphorylation by about 30 to 50% in the case of methylene blue. That's the all important cleanup phase of the process. When these reactive oxygen species are in the mitochondria, they react with linoleic acid and create a poison called malondialdehyde, which damages the delicate mitochondrial DNA. And this leads to obesity, mental illness, dementia, and cancer over time. It also stops the Warburg effect, which is fermentation of sugars for energy production. This is very damaging because it actually creates new, more complex materials like amino acids from these sugars, which not only damages healthy cells, but can be used by cancerous cells for very rapid growth. Fermentation from bacteria is ultimately where all of our complex amino acids come from, and our lipids too. It's bacteria in the soil or bacteria in the belly of a cow, which are eating the plant matter. And it's the cows that actually eat these bacteria themselves. And what they live on is saturated fat. It forces these cells to use oxygen for fuel and also to use the cleanup steps in the oxidative phosphorylation process. And this has many surprising benefits. Now the mechanisms, there's quite a few different mechanisms. The main mechanism revolves around the mitochondria. So the uh, cytochrome C oxidase, which is unit four in the mitochondrial respiratory chain, is accepted as a chromophore for red and near infrared light. And the idea is that you get more oxygen consumption more ATP, the mitochondrial membrane potential goes up. Um, other things happen, but one important thing is that the mitochondrial metabolism switches from glycolysis back towards oxidative phosphorylation, which is important because it has a few effects on, on the whole metabolism. Um, you get a lot of signaling happens based on this mitochondrial activity. You get uh, nitric oxide released, you get ATP and cyclic AMP, you get a brief burst of reactive oxygen species. These activate transcription factors, so June FOS is AP1, um, I kappa B allows NF kappa B to go to the nucleus, and these transcription factors can trigger the expression of over a hundred different genes which is a long-lasting effect. So these proteins that are triggered by this, these transcription factors will last for hours, days, and even weeks. So a single exposure to light can have long-lasting effects. As I said, this switch of glycolysis to oxidative phosphorylation is important for two reasons. One is that stem cells are activated stem cells in their hypoxic niche carry out glycolysis but when the mitochondria are activated they need oxygen so they have to get out of their niche when they can undergo proliferation and differentiation programs the second effect of this glycolysis to oxfos switch is anti-inflammatory so macrophages have an m1 phenotype and a pro-inflammatory carry out glycolysis when oxfos is activated, they switch to the M2 anti-inflammatory phenotype. 
And if these happen to be microglia in the brain, they can undergo phagocytosis, for instance, disposing of amyloid plaque that clogs up the brain tail. But we did discover quite a few interesting things about how shining light on the head has beneficial effects. And we've summarized them in this diagram here. So there's a lot of different processes here and there is positive evidence for all of them actually. If I had to choose just one, I would probably choose phototherapy because it's easier and it's cheaper and it's harder to overdo it, but they will work better together than separately and the methylene blue will have a stronger and more immediate effect. My red light setup is three Wolzec red light slash near infrared LED combo bulbs. I initially bought five of them, but after a few years, one of them died. And I wound up giving the other one away to someone who wanted it. For my shoulder, I put the light directly onto the shoulder for about 10 minutes. When I do my whole body, I put the lights about one foot away using gooseneck lamps. And then I do that for about 20 minutes a day. These are very bright LED devices, so you may need longer exposure for smaller ones. People have lately claimed in the comments that LED is bad for you, but that's not true at all. A photon is a photon, and this is proven extensively in phototherapy research. Lasers, LED, and any other sources are all the same once the photon is released. LEDs can be extremely bright though, but if it's diffused through a bulb or a lampshade, then it won't cause any issues. There is a problem with fluorescent lights due to the flicker rate though, and you should probably avoid these if possible. Methylene blue has amazing benefits, and it will help every cell in the body be healthier and live longer. Because of this, it probably has benefits for aging and obesity, and it will definitely have benefits for delaying the physical signs of aging by giving you much healthier skin. Dosing is very important for methylene blue, and I would only go over 30 milligrams a day with extreme caution, and that's about 60 drops a day if using a 1% solution, but this is gonna depend on the dropper too. Even five to 10 milligrams should help quite a bit with most problems though. It's important to realize it's not merely an antioxidant, which typically does little or nothing at all in real world applications. It has a much stronger effect than that, and best of all, it really readily absorbs and gets to where it's supposed to be, which is in the mitochondria. It gives the effects that people would want and expect from a powerful antioxidant, but that in practice we usually just don't get. Methylene blue works by producing ATP without producing reactive oxygen species in the first place, while simultaneously providing ATP to mitochondria which allows them to trigger the cleanup of reactive oxygen species. This is going to help literally every cell in the body, but it's especially useful for preserving your stem cell pool, which is a very important research in aging. This also helps your brain a great deal, which is full of mitochondria, and methylene blue is long known as a nootropic that enhances cognition and aids in both long-term and short-term memory. And while long-term memory is somewhat easy to help, short-term memory is very, very difficult to increase, especially in a safe manner. Dementia is essentially caused by mitochondrial death over time, especially from a bad diet high in carbs and linoleic acid from seed oils. And methylene blue can undo a great deal of this damage. Like taurine, glycine, and alpha-ketoglutarate, it's going to help with nearly all diseases of the body and mind. It's also going to help a lot to reduce insulin resistance and either rescue or kill off these unhealthy cells before they become senescent and start to cause problems in the body. It's especially helpful to neurons and those with diseases like multiple sclerosis or ALS, aka Lou Gehrig's, should definitely consider trying some. Methylene blue also yields positive benefits in the gut microbiome by getting rid of negative gut bacteria that impair cognition and promoting the positive gut bacteria. 
In rodent studies, at low doses, cognition was improved even after discontinuing treatment. So it's not just the methylene blue itself improving the cognition because it's fixing your gut microbiome. But be careful because at the larger doses, it actually had the opposite effect in harmful gram-negative bacteria flooded the gut and caused cognition and digestive issues. I could literally find new studies all day long, but I already have over 30 and that's probably more than I'm going to manage to actually get into the, the video. For many issues, if it works for one similar type of issue, it should help with all of them. For autoimmune disease, for example, they're all basically the same in origin, or at least they have similar contributing factors at play. If something triggers t reg cells or increases collagen production to heal the gut, you can be sure that it's going to help a bit with these autoimmune issues. And methylene blue does this and many other things that should help. Similarly, mitochondrial dysfunction and neuroinflammation is associated with basically all mental illness. So it should help not just with the ones noted here, but essentially all of them to at least some extent. There are hundreds of thousands of mitochondria in each neuron. And some of them, the most healthy ones, have millions. Methylene blue is a very weak MAOI inhibitor. So if you take psychiatric meds like SSRIs, then it could cause issues. It shouldn't be much of a problem at low doses, but it may be at higher doses. It also may be a bad idea to take it during pregnancy. Some people do not clear methylene blue very easily from the body. So if your skin and eyes turn blue, then immediately stop taking it. And you should either just avoid it or else take only extremely low doses where these side effects don't occur. I don't take it right now and I haven't decided on a brand. But when I start again, I plan to take 20 milligrams a day, even though I've gone as high as 60 milligrams in the past. And after looking up more studies for this video, you can rest assured that I will be picking some up next time I do my supplement shopping. But I want to make sure that I can find a safe bulk source with a reasonable price, which has been tested for purity. In addition to methylene blue, I also recommend taurine and glycine. Personally, I take six grams of taurine and glycine, three grams of AKG, alpha ketoglutarate, one gram of TMG, and one gram of cysteine. And these are supplements that most people should consider taking, though it may not be for everyone and those doses are just what I take, so you'll have to determine what's right for you. I highly recommend Methylene Blue, especially if you have a friend or family member who isn't doing so good in the cognition department. What is this? A center for ants? How can we be expected to teach children to learn how to read if they can't even fit inside the building? Which is also an ideal supplement for dogs or for your fish because you can just put it right in the water and you can be sure that they'll absorb it. I can guarantee you if you buy methylene blue, you'll never be sad that you did. Though I can't guarantee it won't make you a little blue.